I'm John Chowney with Campbellsville University, host of Dialogue on Public Issues, welcoming our audience back once again for what I consider to be one of the more important uh, segments of the show that, that I've done for a good while. 2020 has been a very challenging year. We've come through the holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas, moving toward the new year in the midst of COVID uh, pandemic and still dealing with that, even though life is at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines coming. But uh, I'm very pleased today to be interviewing a gentleman who may have some very good words of hope and encouragement, Dr. Scott Wigington. Dr. Wigington, welcome. Dr. Chani, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with you and always look forward to the conversation. Well, I appreciate uh, all that you do. Share with uh, our audience uh, uh, about yourself, your background, experience, and the work you're doing uh, at Campbellsville University, as well as your counseling practice. Sure, I've been with Campbellsville since 2004 mm -hmm. and uh, serve as professor of pastoral ministries and counseling. And so I, I teach as lead professor in pastoral ministries or for, for some uh, practical ministries. Uh, and then I've helped over time uh, in the development of our marriage and family therapy program and teach in that and currently uh, serve as main campus liaison. We have a great director in Dr. Ken Hollis in Louisville. Um, I've been married 35, year, 35 years almost. I guess uh, I got to make it another month to Elizabeth. We have three adult children. And, um, you know, I, my, my path to Campbellsville was really interesting. And I'll just share just a little bit of that and it may help with, with how I've uh, come here. Uh, came to Christ as an 18-year-old uh, who was getting ready to go to major in journalism at Western Kentucky University, and I did actually that. I went to Western and was a journalism major, and through my college years was called uh, to ministry. The uh, first person in my family that, that, that experienced a call in that way, and um, went to seminary afterwards, um, left uh, after an MDiv at Southern Seminary, and served a, a large church in Alabama where I met my wife, but I discovered while I was there that I loved counseling. Wasn't very good at it, but I loved it. And so uh, that moved me back on a path to a second master's and a PhD, and then have pursued licensure and have been licensed for uh, many years as a, a marriage and family therapist. And then I have another licensure as a pastoral counselor, and then um, uh, supervise, uh, marriage and family therapists and pastoral counselors and, and, and as any counselor will develop kind of specialty areas and certification. So currently um, my full-time job is at Campbellsville University, but I also have a, a, a counseling practice that I work in and supervise at Campbellsville Baptist Church called Lighthouse and have two great colleagues that work with me there, uh, Whitney Brainerd and um, Sarah Creason. Sarah's our newest uh, addition. And so, um, we, uh, we, we love what we have the chance to do in, in, in terms of helping people. How would you uh, define professional Christian counseling, Dr. Wigington? And related to that core question, how does it differ from other approaches to counseling? And do you work with other uh, professional mental health providers? In some cases, I know I'm uh, putting a lot in one question, but I think all those points are interrelated. Uh, that's a great, it's a great question. And it's, it is so, I could go on for days. I'll try to keep my answer uh, as tight as possible. Professional Christian counseling is, is an interesting term because you can, you can look at uh, professional counselors on the one hand, and you can talk about Christians. And there are some counselors who happen to be Christian. There are other counselors who being Christian is a really important part of their professional identity. Um, I come from a, a school of thought that some term integrationist. So we believe that it's really important to have good solid clinical training and to bring the best of the behavioral sciences to bear on a whole a vast array of issues that people deal with. But we also want to be solidly um, um, aware of and sensitive to uh, a Christian worldview, and particularly each of us comes from a, a conservative evangelical worldview, but that does not mean that we press that on, on our counselees, but we want to be sensitive to, to each person that comes in as to spiritual issues. We really want to, to pay attention to what brings them uh, to us. 
And of course, there's so many different types of uh, professional counselors and probably the biggest distinction that a lot of the listeners today might uh, appreciate is uh, we hear a lot of times, well, so-and-so has gone to a psychiatrist and a psychiatrist is a medically trained, um, where well, they're a doctor, they're a physician. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, most psychiatrists don't do much, if any therapy, they just do psychopharmacology. So they'll diagnose and, and treat with um, uh, the proper medications for mental health issues, while others will do the actual counseling. So I happen to be a, a marriage and family therapist, and we're trained to, not just in marriage and family therapy, but that's a specialty. But we also work across an array of different uh, concerns, anywhere from depression to anxiety to obsessive compulsive disorder to spiritual issues, just about anything you can think of. Um, but there are other counselors that are well trained as well, licensed clinical social workers, for example, uh, licensed professional counselors would be another example, uh, psychiatric nurses, uh, clinical psychologists. And so each one of those is trained in a, in a different way, but have certain specialties that they bring to bear you know, on the counseling uh, profession. We do work a lot with other disciplines. I mean, it's very uh, common for Sarah or Whitney or myself or one of our colleagues to be working with somebody and to, to realize, you know, this person really would benefit from some psychometric testing. So for example, I might refer them to a clinical psychologist who specializes in, is in testing, and then we could get the results of those tests. Or I might refer them if they have a medical need to a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist, and uh, she will look at the uh, uh, possible uh, diagnoses that might fit uh, that person and look at whether or not some medication could be helpful. And then she and I will talk back and forth about you know her perceptions of what's going on and. Uh, would just collaborate. So it really is a rich, I think it's a rich field uh, in terms of developing colleagues and realizing that each of us brings something to bear that can really be helpful and healing to, uh, to our patients. Let me uh, put this question forth uh, while it's on my mind. Dr. Wigington, if there's anyone watching our show uh, uh, and 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 list or listening uh, on WLCU radio that feels like they need help and would be interested, uh, for example, uh, in uh, having counseling through Lighthouse Counseling. How how can they reach you or your colleagues? Well, the easiest way to to reach us would be to call, and I, I can give you the number uh, here, and and perhaps we can post it on the screen as well. It's two seven zero. Four six five eight one one five extension two sixteen. Uh, I also give my personal cell phone. If you if you can't get through to that number, it's uh, right now it's the holidays and sometimes it's hard to, to get through to that number. My personal number is two seven zero five seven two one four one one, and they can call and you can leave a secure voicemail. Uh, the first number I gave you, or certainly my cell phone's got a secure voicemail. And I'll return your call, um, talk with you about what's going on and determine who would be the best person to see you. Uh, and then even do you have a preference for a male or a female counselor? And some of that uh, would have to do with uh, what certain person's specialties are. You know, we tend right. to be some of us better at certain things than others. So uh, we'd be certainly glad to return any calls and, and, and to work with, with our listeners. Very good. Thank you. Now, 2020, as I said in my opening remarks, has certainly been a challenging year on many levels. Uh, certainly the most profound impact has been that of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. Uh, what uh, general impacts have you observed uh, in, in your practice of counseling resulting from uh, the pandemic? Well, I mean, we've seen, you know, just certainly there's been so much um, isolation, um, mm -hmm. loneliness, probably the, the biggest thing that we hear uh, is how isolated people are and how that isolation and even an overabundance of bad news, uh, overexposure to bad news this year has resulted in, in greatly increased anxiety and depression. In fact, people who probably never would have dealt at a clinical level with depression or anxiety, it was just latent. And then uh, the combination, I think, of COVID uh, certainly of some of the, the massive uh, political divisions in our country, the racial tension 
violence in our country, all of those things have served to kind of exacerbate um, anybody that would be a little bit anxious or depressed, especially if they're, if they're overexposed to, to news media, uh, can really struggle. Um, and I think, you know, I'll see things like uh, a lot of people that are saying, you know, but I don't sleep very well anymore. Uh, I, I really find myself, I'm not going to work. I find myself uh, worrying a lot more. I've never thought of myself as a worrier, but yet you've got individuals who now feel, feel stuck on some of these topics. You, you've touched on this, but look to probe a little more on mental health or emotional health. How has COVID impacted the general mental health of people and has the fear uh, the actual fear of contacting the disease impacted uh, people? It, it really has. Back in May, the U.S. Census Bureau reported that about a third of Americans were showing increased signs, reporting that they showed increased signs of clinical depression and anxiety. And people deal with, with that differently. I know one uh, person has written an article that's talked about one form that coping has taken in what he terms the pandemic. Uh, Covenant Eyes, the, the, really the world's leader in internet filtering, reports that 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say that they view porn at least once a month. And uh, at least one of three visitors to an adult porn site is female. And the younger generation reports it's almost even now between um, between men and women in terms of viewing uh, porn sites. So during the pandemic, the dangerous porn demic has actually exploded. And uh, Pornhub, the world's largest free pornography site, reports just astronomical growth in daily visits as people worldwide use that as a way to cope with stress and isolation and additional free time. And so I think that's one, just one way that people have coped with anxiety and with depression. I think it's really interesting the way we think about it, Dr. Chowning, sets us up either to be healthier or to struggle. Uh, for example, early on, the reported death rate from COVID was uh, four in 100. And we know that that was based on few documented cases. It was, uh, it was a very limited um, testing with pretty um, outrageous claims in terms of a high death rate. Now, after a lot more testing, independent tests are confirming that the death rate among the general population is more like two in 1,000, and even less with children, and of course more with population over 70. But the average age of death from COVID is right at 77 years old. Unfortunately, I don't know that that message has gotten out, and I think what's people are so driven by uh, the anxiety that they tend to hear the old messages that may not be based on, uh, on accurate information. And, and our treatments, I might add, uh, for COVID are a lot, a much improved. Mm. Uh, the actual therapeutic treatments, we haven't found a cure. We have a vaccine, of course, uh, that are in play as we do this interview, but uh, even the ther monoclonal antibody treatments and so forth, the therapeutics are much better than they were at the beginning, as, as are other uh, even uh, issues like whether to put, and I'm, I'm obviously not a medical doctor or a, uh, a, a, an intensive care specialist, but whether or not to put a patient on uh, a, uh, a, a machine or, or not uh, in terms of when they're having uh, uh, breathing issues and respiratory problems, those simple, the, the proning the position of the body and so forth to uh, just a, a sundry things that are much improved now uh, as b compared to the beginning in, in terms of the treatment of, of our patients. The other thing that strikes me is that so much of the reaction to COVID has to do with a lot of times people's natural personality types. And there's some that tend to be naturally more anxious than others. And when they're in a good place, they can actually be doing quite well and you would never know they're an anxious personality type. But mm -hmm. when, when environmental uh, situations change, when circumstances uh, present them with a, a deluge of just 
goodness, moment to moment, uh, moments where they're hearing bad news, more bad news across not just the United States, but the world. Then I think they move to a place where they begin to, to get caught up in some of that core struggle of, of fear and anxiety and worry. Does the virus, in your opinion, have any long-term effects on mental health or neurological impairment that impact behavioral patterns? I think, I think it's really interesting. And I, I wonder over time as we, as we get back longer term studies, if we'll, we'll find that out. Certainly when people feel threatened or their lives are altered in major unwanted or unanticipated ways, communication between parts of the brain, for example, the prefrontal cortex, which is the executive center of the brain and the amygdala, which is the emotional processing center, uh, those may be disrupted. And when, when that happens, the amygdala stays almost on constant alert. Mm. And that leads to the production of stress hormones that can cause distress in the body, as well as the mind. So people may experience things like increased heart rate, uh, changes in respiration, mus muscle tension, irritability, um, disturbances in sleep, appetite, concentration, and even uh, repetitive thoughts that have to do with helplessness or uh, perceived danger. And so over time, those you know, neural pathways in the brain uh, can be rerouted by the way we think and the way we meditate. And so even at, you know, ages old practices like med meditation are extremely important, not simply because they help us to think about things that tend to be more focused, but because God knew when he created us that what we think about will create neural pathways that will form um, dominant ways of thinking and even uh, habits and behaviors that we'll choose to involve ourselves in. So I think it really should be interesting over the next, you know, five to 10 years as people uh, research and do study uh, on longer term results of something like uh, this virus to see what, what we can learn. Yeah, and we're, we're only beginning to, to realize there may be some long-term, even physiological uh, considerations and impacts of COVID. Moving into uh, the new year, 2021, just around the corner, what issues do you see that are most impactful on the minds and the health of people? Well, certainly... As we, as we move forward with the pandemic, I think, as you said in your opening, the, the hope is that the uh, vaccines, that herd immunity, I saw uh, recently Dr. Fauci talking about the fact that we should see herd immunity beginning to develop in the months ahead. Um, but I think the other issues are, are significant. The racial uh, tensions in our nation, as we move into 2021, the stark divisions and the lack of civility in our political system. Uh, I have one of my three children, John, as you know, it, my daughter works for the Commission on Presidential Debates. And so she lives inside the Beltway. She's been in Washington now through two debate cycles. And one of the things that, that Hope reports is that the, uh, the level of the lack of civility, the level of um, discordant discourse within voices in Washington, D.C., she says, you know, growing up as a, as a person who's always loved politics, she's never seen anything like the level of discord that she sees. And she, her name is actually indicative of the way she looks at our political system. She's been very hopeful, um, very much a supportive of, of the way America works, and she still is. But but what she has realized in, in kind of reports from the Capitol is just how, how divided not just our nation is, but starting at the very top. And of course, that wouldn't be any surprise, certainly to you or uh, maybe even to our listeners. It's just a divided system. So I think people um, are living in a system that's flush with anxiety. And then the question becomes how, when the system is so full of anxiety and anger, uh, how do we live in such a way that we can foster peace in the sense of being able to be in this, but not caught up uh, by it and infected by it. Dr. Wigington, is the rate of suicide increasing or decreasing among the population? 
and related to that general question, what age groups are the most susceptible at this point in time? And importantly to anyone watching, what words of advice would you give to people in general or family of those who may be having suicidal thoughts or struggling uh, over time with suicidal thoughts? Right. Uh, the number of people who say they have considered suicide uh, has increased really dramatically during uh, the COVID crisis. And I think that the highest numbers we're seeing are in the 18 to 24 year old age group where now one in four, 25% are saying that they have considered uh, suicide in the last 30 days. Uh, we know that that's a group that there was, was already an increased risk over time. That it used to be that suicide was the third leading cause of death among 18 to 24. Now it's the second, and that was even before COVID hit. So we see that group, and of course, as a, as a professor and as, as a long-term administrator at uh, Campbellsville University, you, know, you and I both know how uh, seriously we've had to take, and our university has taken student health, and so it's disturbing to think that that group particularly has been affected. And when you begin to ask about why, one of the things that seems to come up is that this is a population that has such a short timeline that they've lived, that when something happens, they, they tend to have a hard time imagining that things will change. And so it's difficult for them to imagine that as hard as COVID has been, as difficult the situations in our country and our world have been, wow, couldn't that really change? And so it leads them to feel, feel despair. The other group that's a pretty significant, uh, probably the biggest at-risk group for um, suicidal thoughts and even follow through are our older adults, 65-year-old um, plus adults and particularly white males. Um, we guess could talk about different reasons for that, but I do think it's really important to, to pay attention as a family member to uh, those susceptible groups uh, to begin to pay attention to the fact that when somebody is uh, reporting consistently things like, I feel hopeless, I feel helpless, I'm fatigued, I'm withdrawing from activities that I've normally participated in and enjoyed, I'm isolating myself, uh, not because I'm uh, in quarantine, but because I'm just depressed. I'm isolating myself from family and friends um, I'm, I'm having sleep difficulties. Um, when people start reporting those kinds of things as clusters, not as an isolated, you know, in, all of us deal with some of those in isolated ways. I might have a, a week where it's hard to sleep or a period of time when uh, I'm just feeling more fatigued. But when we see those things start to cluster in five or six, and then when people begin to make comments, maybe like, you know, I just really can't imagine going on um, I, they begin to, to offer possessions to people. They begin to go back. I think I'm going to redo, redo my will. They start to, to indicate that they're just not interested in living anymore. I think one of the big mistakes people make is they think, well, I don't want to ask them about suicide because if I do, it's more likely that they will make an attempt. And that's really a myth. Um, I really want to, if I'm a family member or a friend, think about three levels in terms of uh, suicidality. The first one is thoughts. Uh, have you had thoughts about this? And uh, how long have you been thinking about it? And what thoughts are you having? And then the second level is, do you have uh, a plan? Have you actually thought about a way that you would make an attempt to harm yourself or to take your life? And, and if somebody says, I have thoughts, but I really don't have a plan, well, I, I want to take that seriously, but it's obviously more serious if they have a plan. And then the third level, if they say I have a plan is, well, you know, would you actually think you would follow through on that? Um, and some people would say, no, I mean, I, I guess I know how I would do it, but I would never follow through. And well, why not? Well, I, I wouldn't do that to my family. I wouldn't do that to my friends. So those are really the three levels I want to think on thoughts in a plan and intent. And in the event that uh, individuals come up uh, with a yes on all three of those, then I'm always going to want to think about, you know, who can help. Uh, and typically I'm thinking about a suicide hotline number, 
and we can certainly, we'll, I think, may post that on the screen during this interview. We can talk about a counselor. It's good to know um, a well-trained Christian counselor that you can pick up the phone and call. Uh, if you don't, your pastor is a great resource or friend's pastor is a great resource. They, they will be able to, to help you get to the right person. Um, in our area, we've got some really good hospitals. I mean, certainly somebody in Taylor County could go to the emergency room at uh, Taylor Regional Hospital. Um, Lincoln Trail uh, has a wonderful behavioral health unit, and you, there's actually a number, we'll post that on the screen as well, that you can actually call, and they can uh, do an assessment with somebody over uh, a Zoom link, uh, secure um, uh, internet platform, and can literally tell you if you have criteria and you really are struggling, they can find you a bed and, and, and get your person help at a hospital. So I think those are real, real concrete things. I do think whenever somebody brings up that they are thinking about harming themselves or taking their life, we always want to take that seriously. We always want to uh, feel that you never want to be bound to confidentiality. I know sometimes somebody who's thinking about harming themselves will say, well, I'll tell you this, but you can't tell anybody. And the one place where you always know that you can break confidentiality with integrity is when somebody's life is at stake. So if somebody's life is at stake, I'm going to get somebody else involved because the alternative is, uh, is unthinkable, that it would be not taking mm -hmm. it seriously. And so again, finding the, the will and the courage to say, I'm going to make sure that I have somebody else that will help me think through this if I'm trying to help somebody who's suicidal. This is going to be the final question. We're down to a minute, I think, on our time, Dr. Wigington. We're moving into a new year, as I've said. We're in the midst of the COVID-19 storm and the surge on the surge, even with a light at the end of the tunnel with better treatment and the vaccine. We've come past an, a very bitter election. Emotions are still running high as we do the interview. Uh, the nation is divided, as you mentioned, racial tensions and the need for racial justice and equity is certainly on the table. Uh, very much apparent, the economy is struggling. Drug addictions are running high. We've had a number, record number of overdoses in our own community. A new president and vice president are coming to power in January. And on goes the list. We've just come through the holidays, a lot of extra depression, even uh, for some people, even in the best of years when the holidays are with us. What words of encouragement would you share as we close? What should be the perspective of people of faith? And what should be the reaction of the Christian community to these numerous challenges as we move into the new year? I think about two verses. I think about two uh, things the Apostle Paul shared with a, a society that was dealing with some pretty tough times himself. I love 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear or anxiety, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. In fact, because we live under his care, we, can, we have some resources. And that particular verse points out three. We have a spirit of power. That means each of us can choose to do certain things. Uh, and rather than focus on what we can't do, we can focus on what we can do. We can reach out and help somebody. We can control exposure to the news. We can uh, focus on the positive. We can get outside and move, and we're made to get outside and move, and that helps us with our mental health. We can be more social. We can do some things we enjoy. Um, we can't ask for help if we need it. He gives a spirit of, of, of power. He also gives us a spirit of love we are a part of something and we're, we're made to love and we're made to be a part of groups and families. And I think finding ways to do that in COVID, we may have to be a little more creative, but there's nothing to be said that every day we can't be on the phone talking to people or scheduling Zoom calls. And then it says he gives us not just power and love, but he gives us a sound mind. And I think what that means is God wants to renew our minds. He wants us to help think thoughts after him. And so we want to capture those things that we're tempted to rehearse in our minds that are just not true. It's not true that COVID's going to last forever. It's not true that COVID is a uh, one of the deadliest plagues that's ever come along. 
uh, it's not true that uh, things aren't going to return to normal. You know, what, what that means, we, we don't know. There may be some changes, but we know that uh, there's some things that we can trust if we will just um, be careful about the thoughts that we entertain. Then the second verse I would just share as we, as we finish up is Philippians 4, 6 through 10. And Paul writes, don't worry about anything. But in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So we want to substitute prayer for worry. Whenever you're worried, it's a great prompter to be one who prays. And then finally, Paul writes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent and praiseworthy, dwell on these things. So focusing and meditating on the goodness and the things I have to be thankful for, and I, I'll, I'll glance at those other things, but I really want to gaze at the good things. Dr. Scott Wigington, thank you so much uh, for your time and these words of counsel and these words of hope. And I think uh, we will all take them to heart and apply them as we move into 2021. This is John Chowning for Dialogue on Public Issues, encouraging all our listeners and all of our viewers uh, to consider what Dr. Wigington has shared with us in this interview. There is hope mm -hmm. and uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, certainly God is with us. He sits on the throne. And as we move into 2021, let's, uh, hang in there and stay together. And uh, several numbers uh, have been made available. Uh, if you need help, uh, feel free uh, to, uh, to call any of these numbers as appropriate. And certainly feel free to call Dr. Wigington at Lighthouse Counseling. He and his colleagues do a wonderful job. This is John Chowning wishing all of you God's richest blessings and a very blessed 2021 to all. Thank you.